Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Reading and Engaging with Existing Digital Humanities Projects, which is sponsored by Springer Nature. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started today, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you should be able to follow along with the presentation materials. Along the right-hand side, you should see a Q&A panel and a chat panel. If you don't, please click the button labeled chat and Q&A or the chat or Q&A in the upper right-hand corner of the screen to activate the panels. The Q&A panel allows you to submit questions to our speakers and uh, please feel free to do so throughout as they will be holding those until the end and, and taking them at that point. You can also use the chat panel to uh, address any technical issues that you may be having to me directly, and I will troubleshoot those with you privately. Today, we are using the hashtag ACRL Choice Webinars during the event, so if you have another screen handy, please shout out to us. At, we're at choice underscore reviews on Twitter. Um, also note that we are recording today's program and everyone who registered will receive a follow-up email with a link to the archived version. And here to introduce today's presenter is Michael DeSanto from Springer Nature. Um, over to you, Michael. Thanks, Mark. And again, welcome everyone. We are excited to have Paige Morgan here with us today for a look at the utilization of digital humanities projects in the context of research and curriculum support. Paige is the Digital Humanities and Scholarship Librarian at the University of Miami. Prior to joining the University of Miami, she held a clear postdoctoral fellowship at the Lewis and Ruth Sherman Center for Digital Scholarship at McMaster University. She holds a PhD in English and Textual Studies from the University of Washington. In the past 10 years, Paige has worked within the field of digital humanities in several capacities as a researcher, instructor, data wrangler, and community curriculum builder. She specializes in contexts where digital scholarship is a new endeavor for an institution and there are few formal courses, training programs, or local experts available. At this point, we're ready to get started. Over to you, Paige. Now I do. Okay, there, I've got control. So, um, hi there. Apologies for that bumpy start, but as Michael said, I'm the DH and Scholarship Librarian at UM. I started getting interested in DH almost 10 years ago while I was still a graduate student in English, and I figured out quite quickly that I could do more of the things that I considered interesting from within a library rather than in a tenure-track department. You already know that today's webinar is about digital humanities, but there's a point that I want to start off with that's really important. DH, or digital humanities, is often thought of as a, and I've lost control of the slides again. There we go, as a beautiful fusion of scholarly materials and technology and critical thinking all wrapped up in a beautiful sparkly package. And sometimes it really does look like that, but more often it comes out looking more like uh, something that's a bit more rough around the edges. It has areas where it needs work. It's lovable, but looks decidedly imperfect. And what I want to say and emphasize is don't let the imperfections put you off. We are all chasing the kitten of perfection, but anyone who's engaging with digital humanities, whether as a creator or as a reader or project user, is also making friends with a tarantula dog. DH projects generally go through many iterations and experiments as they grow, and just because one looks less glossy isn't actually a good measure of its value. 
So in my role, I often help people who are interested in building DH projects or working with data, but there's a set of questions that people don't often ask, not nearly as much. Here they are. These are really excellent questions. Um, asking people how to find DH projects is perfectly valid. They're an important aspect of the DH research cycle. And let me be clear, DH projects need readers as, just as much, or maybe more, as they need people to build new DH projects. Projects that are built are not built just for the DH community or the community who likes to program tools and applications, but intended for the whole community of researchers interested in that topic. And one thing that the larger digital humanities and greater academic community hasn't fully figured out yet is how to get people to actually find and read DH project. And projects, and that's why I opted to talk about this today. Um, so these questions are also questions that I can imagine subject and reference librarians being asked by faculty and grad students in various areas. And of course, I think that librarians could also absolutely field these questions, whether or not they identify as DHers. Moving forward. I called this webinar Reading and Engaging with Existing DH Projects, but I probably should have called it Finding Reading and Engaging, because sometimes finding is the hardest part. DH projects aren't yet regularly being cataloged like some digital resources are, and they often have varied institutional status. One project might have been built by an, a large official institutional team from a prestigious university. Another one might have been built built by a tenured professor with a couple of RAs. Another is built by a graduate student or a junior faculty member who is scraping by with almost no resources at all. And another might be built by a small nonprofit. Some projects will look very official. Others will look less so. And their branding and glossiness isn't necessarily a good measure of their quality. While there's no central repository or index of DH projects, and I can tell you that the community has learned that building and maintaining such an index is a lot of work, I can give you a good set of places to look to get started. The advanced research collaboratory sites that you can see here offer peer reviewing and then listing for projects related to various topics. Nines is for 19th century projects, Mo Modnets is for modernism, Zero is for studies in radicalism online. Core and Share and Figshare and Zenodo are all data reposit well, repositories of various sorts. They are places where you might look to find components, such as conference presentations, publications, data sets, etc., that would also lead you to existing projects. And I know that the Share team has been working incredibly hard to develop new ways to capture DH project metadata and information. So a special shout out to that group for working on it because their hard work is going to make things easier for all of us to discover amazing projects that we ourselves and that our faculty and graduate students want to be able to discover. Because finding projects is a problem, and many people are aware of that, and because of the institutional complexities that I've already mentioned, many scholars have also been working to develop very complete lists of ongoing DH projects related to various topics, such as Black DH, Latinx, Women and Gender Studies, Mapping and GIS projects. So I've listed several of those here, but I also want to encourage you whether or not you have a Twitter account, because you don't need one, to use Twitter's search interface along with keywords like, well, key phrases like DH project and keywords related to research areas that you're interested in. And I have often found projects that I thought were fascinating that way just by searching Twitter because Twitter is a place where people often go to talk about what's, what they're doing with DH. 
there are a number of project genres, including resource aggregation sites, digital editions, mapping projects, database projects, text analysis projects, and data sets. And I would not call this a complete list of project genres. In particular, I'm seeing more and more data set focused projects where people are building data sets, but not focusing on, say, building web interfaces for them. That's a relatively new development. I expect that um, we may see more developments in that area and new sorts of DH projects in the future. One of the best intros to reading and reverse engineering DH projects is Miriam Posner's How Did They Make That series, which I have clumsily forgotten to link in this slide, but I assure you that if you Google it, you should be able to find both her original um, blog post and a really fantastic video presentation that she made that can be incredibly helpful for anyone. It's not oriented towards it's it is specifically oriented towards DH newbies and people who don't work with DH projects as much and Posner introduces a really excellent heuristic which is seeing DH projects as sources processed and presented that is the creators have taken some sort of material often primary source doc documents process them in some way, and there are a lot of ways they can process things, and then presented them for readers. I'll give you a few examples just to give you a sense of it. So one major DH project is the Folger Digital Text Project, which takes the Folger Library editions of Shakespeare's plays and marks them up. You can think of this as marking up or annotating what it's doing is adding various information as metadata that allows the texts to be analyzed using different tools and according to different questions, and then presents these texts so that they can be read or used or displayed in various ways with various configurations, that is, with or without the line numbers. And this markup also allows you to do other things as well. For example, you can see that they've got linguistic information in there about each word, including the lemma. There is more info too if you were to go looking. So moving on, Old Bailey Online is another fantastic project, also another big project. It takes as its source material the records of London's Central Criminal Court for nearly 300 years and the creators process them by digitizing them and then structuring them, organizing that data so that it's possible to search different sections of it, such as the name and surname, the offense, the verdict, the time period, and pull back various results. And they present it through a web interface that allows users to easily run these searches without needing any technical knowledge. And then the results are presented both as summaries, which you can see on the left-hand side of the slide, with access to an image of the original document, and if you want, access to the very detailed data that's been structured even further. If you look closely at that, you'll note that you can see the victim name and the gender and the location of where this particular crime took place, St. Martin in the Fields. So they've presented it with incredible variety in terms of what you can do. And then there is one of my very favorite newer DH projects smaller than the Old Bailey Online, but no less exciting, and that would be Smelly London. And the source material that they have used here is over 5,000 medical officer of health reports from Greater London, covering a span of about 130 years and digitized and made available by the Wellcome Library in London. The process in this case involved text mining, 
which is to say using programming to isolate the parts of these reports that mention various smells like air, disinfectant, food, sewer, etc. And connecting that information to info that linked each smell with the particular London boroughs that it was smelled in and the year that it was smelled. And this processed information is presented in an interactive map that allows you to drag a slider to select a particular year and then see a representation of all the smells in each borough from the reports. And clicking on any of the pie charts pulls up a legend with more information, including allowing you to navigate to that original primary source medical report. There can be a huge difference in the type of material that's being selected, processed, and presented. I mean, we've just gone from Shakespeare to smells in the last five minutes. And depending on the context, different sorts of critical and interpretive work might be involved in creating these sorts of sites. Using Miriam Posner's heuristic allows us to start asking a whole range of questions that are much like the questions we would ask of really any scholarly work while focusing in on one particular component like the process or the presentation. That's one start at reading these projects, but it's certainly not the whole approach that you can use. So besides asking myself about sources processed and presented, when I'm reading a DH project or exploring a new one that I haven't seen before, I think of it as some sort of intervention, an attempt to alter the conversations around one or more topics in a particular way. There are several specific questions that you can ask to dig into this. I'm going to start with two. One of them is how would a topic look with a particular project as its starting point? Many DH projects, like many library resources, are designed to introduce people to a particular topic, often an aspect of that topic that might have been less obvious or visible than otherwise. It can be really important to ask what a subject looks like with the source material foregrounded. A good example of this is the Lost Friends project. And this is a project of the Historical New Orleans Collection, and in this case, the sources are personal advertisements from the Southwestern Christian Advocate newspaper, and they've been placed by individuals searching for lost loved ones from whom they were separated by slavery. In this case, the sources are the ads themselves, and they've been processed by being extracted from the newspapers as separate items, and the process has also included adding metadata for the names of the people searching and being searched for, the date and the locations associated with the ads. You can also simply browse through the ads reading them and this site makes it possible to, well by doing that, the site makes it possible to focus on the experiences that former slaves faced in terms of their families and friends being lost. And that's a powerful and I would say under-discussed entry point into the antebellum period. By essentially anthologizing these primary sources, the creators have opened up a wide range of ways that various groups could explore and engage with this content. Another powerful question that we can ask is how people would find these materials otherwise without the site existing and what the site or project is doing to change that. We could talk about that in various terms, say whether the project is making the materials available online for the first time, or whether it's making it possible to read or explore materials in various traditional and non-traditional ways. We could talk about that in regards to some of the projects I've already mentioned, i.e. how the Old Bailey Online site allows people to take a very focused approach to reading the primary sources, searching, for example, for particular offenses or punishments in specific time periods, and how focusing makes it easier to notice particular trends or outliers among those clusters. We could also talk about how Smelly London is working to make it possible so that researchers interested in a variety of subjects, 
subjects including public health, industrialization, urbanization, etc., could explore a particular area of London in terms of the smells reported over time. Some DH projects are working very carefully to organize materials in careful chronological order, but other project creators are thinking about how primary sources might usually be found and intervening by adjusting that. One really great example is of that sort of method is the Black Quotidian. Black Quotidian, curated by Matt Delmont, presents, as you can see, African American history in the form of newspaper articles. In this case, the source material is individual news stories from various sources presented as images along with commentary written by scholars that helps to situate the stories further. As Delmont explains in his introduction, he's focusing on ordinary and mundane events in order to call attention to people and happenings that are not commonly featured in textbooks and documentaries, as well as casting new light on better known subjects. Many of these stories contain content that could be found in library newspaper databases, but students searching for this content might too easily dismiss these articles as not relevant because they didn't involve major historical events or figures. So Delmont has highlighted them by assembling them here. The content of the sources and commentary in Black Quotidian are presented with a particular organization by month, date, and year. But while the month and date go in order from February 1st to 2nd to 3rd and so on, the year jumps around so that you travel from 1980 to 1936 to 1948 to 1956 and so on as you read. And the cumulative effect is to demonstrate not only the variety of everyday black history, but also the way that various aspects of racism, exclusion, and disenfranchisement stay the same throughout history. Reading DH projects involves spending time perusing the content and also thinking about the particular choices and interventions that creators have made in order to make that material dis discoverable from a range of entry points. And doing that involves creating machine-readable data that computer programs and software applications can use to facilitate those entry points and display search results for users in a particular order. Creating machine-readable data is part of Posner's process phase, and it's also something that anyone can explore in greater depth in order to read projects more thoroughly and in more interesting ways. I know that these days it's hard to avoid people talking excitedly about big data, but in fact, small data is just as important to people who are building projects, and it can be just as powerful both for creators and readers. And I want to give you a slightly more in-depth look than I think many of you may have had to thinking about data in DH projects in this next part of the webinar. Let me give you a few key terms as we talk about this, some of which you've already heard, one of which is really new. Data can be material and or information in various forms, text, numbers, images, etc., even audio files. Structured data is just data and metadata that's been organized in particular ways so that it's easier for both machines and humans to read and do things with it. This can be as simple as separating out dates that are associated with different photographs or textual records, or in the case of the Lost Friends Project, separating out the names of the people who are mentioned in the ads. And you have seen structured data already in several of the slides from this project. So data and structured data might be relatively familiar terms. I hear people using them a lot. One that is less familiar and newer, even to many people who are actively working on digital humanities projects, is the term data model. 
Don't be intimidated, though. A data model is actually just a picture of the way that different parts of the data in a project are connected with each other. And if you work with or use bibliographical resources, then I promise you, you have worked with data models before. What you're looking at now is a very simple diagram of a bibliographic data model. I say very simple because, of course, not all bibliographic resources are books. And moreover, they have genres and subjects and editions and, well, really, let's admit, I'm not even scratching the surface of the complexity here, but I'm sure that the catalogers and metadata folks who work with the BibFrame and Ferber models could illustrate this far better. I show you this very reductive data model for a couple of reasons. First, to get you thinking about seeing this sort of diagram and understanding it as the skeleton of most DH projects. You can use a data model in order to see a project's shape. And secondly, I want to make the point that what is in or out of the data model can be incredibly important in terms of what it allows people to discover about how the project was made and the choices that the creators made and what they are trying to get across in terms of making arguments and asking questions. And it can be important in terms of how it allows users to develop research questions or when it doesn't allow users to develop research questions because the data model is too reductive or, well, you can work with very reductive data models. You're just going to spend a lot more time enhancing data. Data models can start small and can evolve. Here, for example, is a basic diagram of the data model that I can see being used in the Lost Friends site. You've got the advertisement, the date, the searchers and freedmen, the past owners, and the places that are involved in each ads. And trying to get the slides to, to advance, and they seem to be stuck. Let's see if I can... So I have frozen slides, unfortunately. Please hang on while we sort this out. And now the slides have jumped. There we go. Okay, technical hiccups, but we soldier on and make it work. So a slightly more complex version of the Lost Friends data model is right here, and mainly it's more complex in that it separates the geographical places into the place where individuals were once together, though enslaved, and their current residences. It also organizes the information around the searcher rather than the, than the advertisement. And I did that because I'm imagining another version of this project that includes info from more than one newspaper, not just the Southwestern Christian Advocate, and imagine searchers placing multiple ads and users of this project wanting to look and see what are all the ads that a searcher with a particular name placed. Another way that this data model and that the project could be developed further would be to include a category for gender. We could say model the gender, both for searchers and freedmen, and if we wanted, for past owners. Doing that could be a step towards asking questions like, how many of the people who are placing these ads are men or are women, and so on and do that for Friedman as well, and that might be an important aspect for researchers developing arguments about this material. I do, however, want to be clear that while this would enhance the project and expand it, it would also take work. Someone would have to do the work of actually looking at the ads and the names of the people mentioned, and then assigning them genders and adding that information as metadata for each ad in the database. That requires time and labor. Sometimes it's a process that can be automated, 
especially if you have a specific list of what you're searching for. But even figuring out that list takes labor. Creating it can be really useful. It's part of what allowed the Smelly London team to process those 5,500 reports. But sometimes, depending on the material, automation isn't possible. And I want to be very clear, even a very simple data model, like the one that's currently in use for the Lost Friends project, can be incredibly useful if it allows people to interact with material. And data models often grow and develop over the life of a project. People who create data models, or even just think about how they would model a particular subject, often have to think about how detailed they want to be. Whether they are creating the data model in order to try and explore a particular research question, or whether they are trying to exhaustively document every feature of the source. It's really important to remember that data models are representations and interpretations and, frankly, arguments that a particular topic can be described by surfacing various features and details, and that these are the features and details that are most important about the sources, and that other features and details are less important. I know that the term data models may sound very technical, but I really want to emphasize and encourage you in saying that you don't necessarily have to be a programmer in order to start exploring a site's data model. And indeed, if you are starting thinking about a DH project and the arguments that it is making or really the argument that it is the arguments that it is setting up to allow other people to make, then starting with its data model or models, depending on how much info is there, is a really great way to go. You can start doing this, too, not by using fancy programming software or coding language, but simply by going to any project and exploring what categories and information are provided along with the material that it's presenting, and then thinking about what is being emphasized here and what's being made visible and what details aren't yet visible. You can also look at the search interface and see what entry points the project is allowing users to dig down into. Though I do want to emphasize um, that not ev that search interfaces don't always allow users to dig down into every aspect of the data model right at first. Um, interfaces are always being developed. I have certainly um, made data models using computer programs, but I have also sketched them out by drawing bubbles on napkins and notebook paper and um, my hand or my arm in a few situations. You really don't, they don't have to be technical. It's bubbles and lines. For any project that you're interested in, thinking about its data model is an excellent way to get a bird's eye view or a view of its skeleton. So, how else can you engage with DH projects? Well, um, one thing to remember is to make friends with the dog, which is to say, remember that projects are often in progress, um, not quite working in 100%, going through a process of experimentation, or often more likely starting out with just a tiny bit of data rather than trying to include everything from the beginning. They are also working under constraints of finance, available labor, and available materials, not to mention copyright. That doesn't mean you shouldn't ask questions about any of those things to find out where a project is. And one reason that I use the cat and dog metaphor is that projects are, I do think of projects as living objects. Um, living in the sense that they bounce around and grow, and sometimes they go to sleep for a while, sometimes they come back as zombies, but really that's another topic for another webinar entirely. So here are a few of the things that engaging with those projects looks like. And truthfully, 
a major aspect of engaging with DH projects is actually just taking the time to find out what ones are emerging or have been developed or are being worked on and being able to recommend them to your students, faculty and colleagues and talk with them about what the projects are doing. Show the projects in your instruction sessions if you know that the content that they are presenting is relevant. If you have a libguide for a particular topic and you know that there are DH projects that are working with that topic, then even just writing up a tiny one paragraph blurb and pointing people to the project and starting conversations about it can be incredibly important and really incredibly interesting too as you connect with experts who are interested in what the project is doing. You can also do some of the thinking that we've been doing just in the past 20 minutes about the material, the categories, and yes, even the data model. And understanding and working to see how and why those materials and categories and the data model were chosen. Some projects will have very detailed write-ups of their process visible, making it very clear why they used particular tools, why they went with particular interpretations. Others won't. And I don't take that as any sort of red flag or warning sign. I have reached out to people to ask them why they're making a particular choice and found that they often love having those conversations and that it's also helpful to them to have people ask questions. And it can be really great as well to go to a faculty member or a grad student who knows a subject better than I do and saying, hey, I found this project that is more in your research area than mine. Can we sit down and talk about what you see here? I'd really like to get your perspective on what this project is doing. That can also lead into various ways of using projects in the classroom, working with faculty members to develop assignments that focus on exploring the content in a particular site. And really, any of the sites that we've talked about today could be fantastic candidates for that. And I'm happy, too, to talk with people about particular pedagogical strategies. There are lots of questions you could ask to explore projects. Some of them are specifically about the data model. For example, if you were going to add one more category to a project, one more data node, what would it be? What would be the most important one to add? Or if you know of two sites that are working with very similar subjects, looking at them and comparing how they handle data. Are they using the same categories, different ones? Do they overlap? or do they really not overlap, then that too can lead to fascinating conversations which are really not technical. They're focusing on the scholarly material and the research subject that is the focus of the project. I say that too to emphasize that just because a project is digital doesn't mean that it's disconnected from print scholarship. In fact, it really shouldn't be. So I often go and look at how a subject that I've seen represented in a digital humanities project is covered in essays and monographs. And I see whether the keywords associated with that project or its de data and metadata categories are also used in that scholarship. Doing that can really help me see the intervention that the project creators are trying to make more clearly and help me ask questions about those interventions and other questions about the sources, how they were processed, how they were presented, and why they were processed and presented in those ways. I also try to remember that projects don't always have access to all the material that might fit into the project. So I sometimes think about whether my own library's digital collections might be a really good fit. Or I think about how they would look to audiences if they were processed and presented the way that another project is working with material. All of these questions help me read and engage with the widest range of projects possible made by people and organizations all over, big and small. And I really love the richness that I see when I read far and wide that way. And I learn more, I think, 
every day just finding finding projects and every day I think oh well I'm I've seen it all nothing's going to excite me anymore and then then I find a project like Smelly London or like Black Quotidian or like any of these so that about wraps things up I'm really happy to take questions from any of you about any aspect of this I also do want to thank Slides Carnival for continually creating more awesome templates that I can use, and my colleagues Helene Williams and Laura Bronstein for talking through aspects of this presentation in advance. So, um, Mark and Michael, over to you for questions. All right, <clears throat> so we're ready to move over to the Q&A portion of the webinar. Feel free to submit any questions you may have at this time in, um, to the Q&A box. Let's see. Okay. I'm seeing a number of questions. I'm just trying to scroll through them to find the stuff. All right. So um, we can start um, uh, um, with this first question here. Can you explain what you see as the relationship between transcription of manuscript material to digital and digital humanities projects? Is it a subset of input input to or a digital humanities project itself? Oh, that is a fantastic question. And the answer can vary depending on, de depending on the context. I would say that it can be a subset of a project, i.e. you might need to transcribe material in order to make it machine readable, but you you could transcribe that material and then put it into a project with a fancy interface but you could also simply release the text files of the transcribed material for other people to other people to do analysis with and there are lots of excellent digital humanities scholars and digital humanities projects that are doing things like that my own library last year released a collection of 50 years of 19th century Cuban newspapers um, that we had digitized and used optical character recognition which is to say using a computer to automatically transcribe those printed documents in order to release plain text and you can find those if you google La Gaceta let's see um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and put that and it, actually if you google La Gaceta data set I have closed down my other browsers or I just grabbed the link but I was worried about things going um, going haywire I can't send it but if you google La Gaceta data set University of Miami you'll find it quickly um, and you can also reach out to me separately if you're looking for it but um, that's one good example of what a data set release can look like and and it can be just as exciting to simply transcribe and release a data set and see what other people do with it as it can be to um, transcribe a data set and then turn it into a more complex project. Great, and uh, we have another question here. How do you deal with faculty who may be reluctant to engage with digital humanities projects? So that is, an excellent and difficult question and I will start out by saying that I don't have I don't have a cure-all relationship a cure-all answer for it I will pay attention to those reluctant faculty members interests and if I can find a DH project that is squarely in the sweet spot for what I think they would be interested in then absolutely I will dangle that in front of them and see whether see whether they're interested in having a conversation about it and sometimes they really are and finding the right project can be the key to giving them a much more concrete window into DH because when they see that project that deals with their area of expertise it's much easier for them to 
to think about the decisions that are being made. However, I there are limits to how to how much effort I will make in this regard, especially if I have faculty members and graduate students and staff and members of the public who are more interested in engaging with DH. I would much rather work with the people who want to engage rather than than um, keeping them wait while I try to evangelize. Great. And another question here, what is the most exciting new development you've seen in digital humanities in recent years? Oh, man. Um, that is, I think, I, that's a hard question to answer. And who knows, I might have a different answer if you ask me next week. And you are free to reach out to me on Twitter to do that. But I would say that it is actually the the emergence of data sets as projects. And data sets are often released, released either as plain text, um, as I talked about a little while ago, but also as CSV spreadsheets. Um, that, and the reason that I find this so exciting is that there are also more and more digital humanities tools that take those spreadsheets as as input. So the combination of having people giving giving me data that I can work with and play with in different tools is just amazing. And I will note that another great that a great source to find these data sets is a newsletter written by Jeremy Singer Vine. It's called Data is Plural. And if you Google it, I think you'll be able to find it right away. And there it comes out every couple of weeks, and I, I never know what's going to show up in it next. Everything from dog and cat names to info about gender and pay, um, and pay status and income. He's incredible about finding some of the most interesting data sets out there. So the emergence of data sets. Great. And also, do you have any examples of digital humanities projects that your library is supporting on your campus or through wider collaboration? Um, so that's a more complicated question in some ways. And the reason that it's complicated is true for many libraries that we're still figuring out, well, what's the right way to do in terms of who is supporting these projects? Does a library support projects for everyone? Because that can get that success. <laughs> success in that regard can be really killer. Suddenly you have 500 people wanting to host DH projects on your library website. Um, and that's also a problem if people move on to other jobs or if they graduate. So tricky question. I will also say that maintaining those projects can get tricky. So I'm actually currently working on a plan for about 50 DH projects were developed in conjunction with the library and with different scholars and researchers on the UM campus building DH projects. And they're about between five and twenty years old, and some of them are some of them are are a little bit more like the tarantula dog than others. And we're working. I'm actually working on a plan to reinvigorate some of them, and that's going to be well. Stay tuned. Stay tuned for that. I expect to be talking more about it more about it later on. So right now, that's. Um, we have many projects, but hosting new ones is a complicated offer, is a complicated thing for University of Miami libraries and for other libraries. Great. And a question about peer review in digital humanities. Um, basically, uh, what do you think of the state of peer review in of digital humanities? Um, and um, are there standards for peer review? You know, that's an excellent question, and again, I'm sorry I keep on saying that it's complicated. I don't mean to dodge anything by saying that, but the field of digital humanities is still relatively new, and especially the current wave of digital humanities, which I would, 
I would date as really starting around 2007 or so and going on since then is still relatively new and that phase has been characterized by more and more more and more tools becoming widely available not just for people who have a lot of money and for dh interest and activities being picked up through more universities and more communities who might be engaged in that peer review I think too that one thing that makes peer review tricky is that there are so many DH research methodologies. There are far more DH research methodologies than there are genres of DH projects. So to some degree you can you can peer review a DH project even if you don't know the research methodology. But in other ways it gets harder and the trick is finding people who are experts in both the subject matter and the research methodology or getting a good group of people together who can collectively talk with each other and and explore that in regards to a particular project. I do think that the Advanced Research Consortium peer review sites, NINES, 18th Connect, ModNets, etc., are doing a really good job of modeling best practices for the rest of the community. And I think that discovering more as more people get involved in DH and start talking will be really exciting. And I especially think that it would be great if we did have more opportunities for people who are not, not digital humanists themselves, but researchers to get involved in peer reviewing DH projects. Great, great. And um, we'll take one more question now and then, um, of course, you know, Paige will um, be in touch with anyone who has submitted a question and can follow up um, with questions that weren't answered at this time. Um, but for one more question here, um, is, is there a threshold measure that uh, one might utilize to determine if a reasonable project, um, if a project is reasonable to pursue based on resources, um, for example, personnel, time? So, I. That depends so much on context that it's really hard to give you a solid answer without seeing a specific context. I will say that we are lucky that there are more and more DH training institutes springing up around the US. Um, there is HILT. Um, humanities Intensive Learning and Teaching, which is in the southeastern U.S. There is the Digital Humanities Summer Institute in Victoria, B.C. at UVic. And going, if you, I know that those, those experiences are often expensive, though there are scholarships available to all people, not just students. If you can make it to one of those and take a workshop, that can often be a really great opportunity to figure out more about what that threshold is. I'm sorry I can't right. give a more thorough answer to that without more detail. All right, that's great. And thank you for all of those questions. It does look like we're ready to wrap up our time together today. And um, we hope you've gained some actionable insight on incorporating digital humanities projects into research. Uh, I'll turn it, over, turn it back over to Mark now. All right, thank you, Michael, and, and thank you, Paige. This is, as Michael just said, Mark from ACRLN Choice. I'd just like to say thank you uh, to you, Paige, and thank you to you, Michael, for presenting today and facilitating the questions. I think it's been a, a really interesting presentation with lots of great examples of uh, super interesting digital humanities projects um, and how to think about them. So thank you very much for that. My pleasure. Thanks all of you who came out and made time for this in the middle of busy days at the end of the semester. I know those times are crazy. Absolutely. And I would just say, uh, as we're wrapping up here, thanks to each of our viewers um, for joining us. And please uh, just know that we did record today's program. 
So be on the lookout for a follow-up email from ACRL and Choice with a link to that. Should be available within about 24 hours of the event. Um, and also, please uh, take a moment to fill out the participation survey, which you should see there in the chat box, and let us know what you thought about the presentation and um, offer your thoughts. We, we love to get those in. So thank you again to everyone out there for joining us today. I hope that you enjoyed this session and that the rest of your day is great.